Okay, we're going to talk about some different treatment modalities for um, respiratory illnesses or um, trauma. So a tracheostomy um, or tracheotomy, you've probably heard of these before, and that is where they have to directly access your trachea through an external location, typically at the base of the neck. Um, it's a sur surgical opening just directly into the trachea. That's a tracheotomy. The tracheostomy is the actual tube that goes into um, the ostomy there, okay? Um, the tubes come in different sizes and they differ just from um, laryngectomy tubes. It just depends on the patient's size, um, the size of the opening, things like that. Um, a cupped trach is a cup at the end of the tracheostomy tube that's inflated with air to fit snugly. And it has like a little cuff around it and it just keeps it in there. Sometimes those can become deflated and at that point you will have to refit it. Um, it prevents aspiration of fluids or escape of air, um, especially whenever they're using um, a mechanical ventilator. We're not going to really go in depth into mechanical ventilators, um, but they are in your book if you would like to review those. They're interesting, um, but that's something that they do in ICUs and you will not be managing that on a floor. Um, the amount of air that's used to inflate that little cuff that um, secures it to their neck um, is just determined by the doctor, the location of the trach, the size of the trach, all of that stuff. Here's a picture of it. They have to have ties that, um, you know, secure the trach in place. Um, here's the tube right here. I'm like pointing with my finger and you can't see where my finger is pointing. But here's the tube right here, this, the, off, the stoma. I'm sorry, I'm losing my brain. Um, here's the cuff that they inflate with the air just to keep it in place. Um, and it goes around the tube. It's not occluding the airway at all. Um, and this is where they will inflate right there and then this is the obturator and that's what they use to help guide the placement of the actual trach tube um, they'll only use that when they're placing it and then they take that out okay um, so respiratory passages um, will just react to the new opening with the inflammatory um, process they will make excess mucus production at first um, and it will become probably pretty red sore irritated uh, around the stoma for a while um, so that's something that we can watch and monitor and make sure that we are um, maintaining skin integrity um, as much as possible. So we want to keep it dry, we want to keep it free of debris, um, to clean it, you know, things like that. Um, so the inspired air will pass directly into the trachea and lungs. Whenever we breathe um, through our nose and our mouth, our air automatically that we breathe externally gets warmed, it gets filtered, um, you know, dust particles and things get trapped into the hairs and in our mouths and everything. So we don't ever get that actually directly into our trachea and lungs. Now, when you're breathing through a trach, it all goes directly into your trachea and lungs. And so it's not getting warmed, it's not getting filtered, it's not getting moistened through our mucous membranes. Um, so the air is very dry and it's actually very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, irritating to the trachea and the lungs and so a lot of times we want to um, add some humidification to the air of people who are breathing through trachs. Um, warmer moisture climates with more humid um, environments are actually easier for people with trachs and also um, when they sleep at night we want to encourage an external humidifi humidifier um, for their bedrooms. It just makes the air a lot more pleasant. Um, Let's see, dry secretions can form around that stoma, and so we want to make sure that we're moistening them, cleaning them, um, and just not allowing a lot of crusts to form because that can eventually occlude their airway. That makes it very difficult for them to breathe, and um, their oxygenation status will drop, and it's not good, right? Okay, so keep it clean. Here's a picture um, of a stoma with the ties, with um, the gauze pads to keep it clean. Um, and we can add some humidification in there too if we need to, but our main goal is to manage the airway and secretions. So if we start noticing, and you can hear it as they're breathing through their trach, you start hearing that they're kind of congested and it sounds like if somebody was breathing through a stuffy nose, like <laughs> Okay, that sound, you know what I'm talking about then it's probably time to go in there and suction out those excess secretions so that we're opening up their airway and not allowing it to get occluded with mucus and things like that. We want to make sure that um, the tape is secure, the ties are tied, 
Never, ever, ever force the tube back in place if it starts coming out. You've got to call the doctor, especially if somebody coughs it out completely. Don't just stick it back in there, okay? You can introduce really, really harmful bacteria directly into the lungs. Once they get a major lung infection, their whole body could shut down. It's not good. Um, you want to change the dressing daily or if it just becomes damp throughout the day. That's good to keep it infection free and um, prevent skin breakdown as well. Um, never ever ever occlude the opening. Um, I heard a story once about a, a nursing student and God bless this poor student, but she was giving a patient a bath and she didn't want fluid to get into the patient's lungs. So she thought, well, whenever they have an IV, I tape a plastic bag around it. So she thought that she was going to tape a plastic bag around the trach. Oh, please don't do that. Patient turned blue very quickly um, because they were getting no oxygen. And that goes the same for blankets and linens and things like that, especially if the patient is immobile. It is our job to make sure that nothing is occluding their trach. Um, suctioning this is a sterile technique. Please watch the video to learn the technique. The main thing I want you to remember is that it is sterile. You can't suction for more than 10 seconds at a time. You need to do intermittent suctioning, and that's where, and I think you learned about this in level one, but you use your thumb on the little opening um, to control the suction. When you put your thumb on, it sucks. When you lift your thumb off, it doesn't, okay? Um, you also cannot do that more than three times in a row. So we call that three passes, no more than 10 seconds each, and you want to oxygenate between each pass. The whole process is sterile, okay? Um, there's different techniques, but you know, that's that for sectioning of a trach. Now the best way to determine if sectioning is effective is to listen to their lung sounds before you section, and you'll probably hear some junky sounds. Listen before, section, listen, see if you need to section again, section, listen. If they're clear, you're done, okay? And a lot of times it's very clear um, whether or not you need to continue sectioning uh, because you are gonna be able to hear that congestion in their lungs and in their airway. Um, all right, so if the cannula is coughed out, call the doctor. Don't stick it in there. There should be a tracheal dilator at their bedside that you can pop in there that's sterile, okay? Um, let's see. ET tubes, those are the endotracheal tubes that they use to intubate people. Um, if a trach is not an option, they have a clear airway and they need to intubate you um, because of respiratory difficulty, if they're in a coma, if, it's, if they're under general anesthesia because of surgery, um, or if they have extensive swelling in their upper airway passages, then at that point they might need to intubate somebody, get that artificial airway in without doing a, a permanent opening through a trach. Um, it can remain in place for up to two weeks. Um, they do inflate a cuff to keep a tight seal again, and it can be attached to a ventilator for respiratory control. There are endotracheal tubes. There's different sizes. This little bitty one is a PD tube, and this one's for a big old guy. Um, so whenever somebody is intubated or on any kind of mechanical ventilation, we are responsible for monitoring their lung sounds, their vital signs, their ABGs, and their oxygen saturation. Those are our key things. The most important thing that we can do when caring for a patient who's on a ventilator or who's intubated and comatose is to make sure that we are performing oral care every four hours because if they're intubated they're not using their mouths at all so we have to maintain oral integrity in order for their mucous membranes to remain intact um, once they become intubated it's also very important to um, keep any dressings or tubings or anything clean and dry um, change the patient's position every two hours to help prevent atelectasis atelectasis is where your lungs collapse and you could eventually have pneumonia um, this is very, very important. You need to remember all of these things. You will be tested over them, and you will have to perform these things in clinical. Any, anywhere you work, no matter what you're doing, these are just key things if you're dealing with a patient who is comatose or non-responsive. Um, and then always evaluate their changes in mental status. If they start waking up, talking to you, they are coherent, things like that, then it might be time to extubate. Extubate means you take the tube out, okay? Um, so you want to make sure that you are sectioning using proper technique. Don't overdo it. Um, provide alternative communication for people who are awake but unable to communicate, like a dry erase board, notepad, etc. Um, be supportive of your family members because it's going to be an adjustment. They're going to be talking to them and probably get frustrated looking for responses, looking for you know, validation and things like that. Um, so always try to alleviate any kind of anxiety or fear whenever you can. 
And then once the patient has been extubated or if they have a trach reversal, um, you want to report any kinds of signs or symptoms of respiratory distress immediately. And if you remember, the very first sign of respiratory distress is restlessness. So just remember that. All right, here's a question. There's the answer. You can pause it, read it over, make sure you get it. That's that. All right, we will come back and talk about other things.